Hello everybody, you're welcome back again to the Reggae Appreciation Society. Dancehall is arguably the most popular form of music as far as the younger generation of Jamaicans are concerned. It emerged from Jamaica's rich and fertile music industry as an offshoot of reggae in the 1970s and developed harmoniously side by side with roots reggae until the mid to late 1980s when pre-programmed digital beats that didn't sound like reggae at all became the driving force of dancehall. Up until that point, dancehall had enjoyed a magnificent run that even the hardest reggae purists had to agree was great music. The mastermind of this golden age was none other than the great Henry John Joe Laws. I personally rate him as one of the most important figures in the history of dancehall. And while the accolades for the greatest must go to the true originator in Count Machuki and the first dancehall superstar in Uroy, Henry John Joe Laws more than anybody is responsible for establishing dancehall as an art form or subgenre of its own. Aside from Coxon Dodd or Joe Gibbs, it's almost impossible to find any other single producer that equals his impact or dominance at a particular point in time. John Joe Laws by the early 1980s had built a dream team of musicians that changed the sound of reggae entirely. But unfortunately, trouble with the law and a prison sentence will take him out of circulation and in his absence, Dancehall took a detour from its previous roots reggae foundation and onto a path that many commentators strongly believe has nothing to do with reggae. Let's take a look at Henry John Joe Laws, the architect of the golden age of Dancehall and the hottest reggae producer of the early 1980s. John Joe was born in 1960 on Olympic Way in the rugged slums of West Kingston. He grew up on McCoy Lane in the nearby Whitfield town a place known as Badman Territory during the bloody political violence that tore Jamaica apart in the 1970s. The neighborhood where John Joe came of age as a teenager was controlled by Claudie Massop, the Don Gorgon of Tivoli Gardens, a JLP party enforcer and one of the most feared men on the island. John Joe was said to be one of the youths rising through the ranks as a JLP street soldier and one who was headed for certain destruction. Luckily for John Joe, legendary record producer Bonnie Lee was on a personal crusade against the violence in Jamaica and worked hard to discourage local youth from a life of crime and instead diverted them into the music industry. John Joe became a beneficiary of Bonnie Lee's scheme and by the age of 18 had started singing with two other young chaps in a trio called The Grooving Locks. When the trio's efforts didn't go anywhere, he gave up the idea of becoming a singer and instead attached himself as a sidekick to popular singer and producer Linval Thompson in that same year. Thompson, who was also a producer, began to credit John Joe Laws as his assistant producer on future projects. It seemed that John Joe had a natural talent for production as he soaked up plenty of knowledge from his mentor and in just one year, he had started producing artists on his own, booking record sessions at the famous Channel One studios owned by the Hukim brothers. Though barely literate and not an instrumentalist, he had an amazing ear for talent and could tell if an artist had real quality. His previous experiences as a bad man in the slums gave him an eye view of the streets that almost no other producer in Jamaica had at the time and with this quality, he was able to find the hottest talents before anybody else. It was while hanging out during a sound system show on Payne Avenue that he discovered a 15-year-old singer with an amazing voice. That kid was Barrington Levy and after taking him under his wing, he took him to Channel One Studios where backed by the studio's in-house band, The Root Radix, a few songs were recorded and one of them became Barrington Levy's amazing breakout hit, Collie Weed, which enjoyed huge success on the Jamaican charts as well as amazing radio airplay. Before the end of the year, Barrington Levy's magnificent debut album, Shaolin Temple, was released and became a resounding success that set Levy up as one of the brightest stars in Jamaica before the age of 16. While this was happening, John Joe was scouting for the next superstar and in late 1979, Winston Foster, aka Yellow Man, had just won the immensely popular Tasty Talent contest. John Joe tracked him down immediately and became his producer. This was a bold move as many other producers had shied away from working with him due to the stigma associated with his skin color at the time. Yellow Man's first album, The Mamad Over Me, also became a huge success in Jamaica and within a year, his next album titled Mr. Yellow Man became a massive local and international success. Yellow Man's second album is largely credited with introducing the world to dance hall as it penetrated the US and UK markets. Around this time, another of John Joe's discoveries, Eka Mouse, 
released the classic album Wadu Dem, which became a smash international hit. Jonjo, in addition to its excellent scouting skills, had developed the winning formula that the world couldn't resist. He combined the raw talent of his artists with the magnificent instrumentals of the Roots Radix band and the mixing skills of a genius studio sound engineer called Hopton Brown, but more popularly known as Scientist. Jonjo also discovered other future legends like Frankie Paul, Rankin Toyan, Coco T, Charlie Chaplin, and others. In addition to introducing new artists, his reputation saw hordes of established and even veteran singers come to him to update their sound. Some of these included John Holt, for whom he produced the hit song Police in Helicopter, as well as Don Carlos, Hugh Mundell, Johnny Osborne, Junior Mervyn, and Alton Ellis. He was the hottest producer in the land, but he noticed that getting radio airplay had become politicized. So he went on to form the now legendary Volcano Sound System in 1983 as a way of getting his music to the masses directly. Volcano eventually became Jamaica's number one sound system by far. As a producer, he's been described by so many of his former artists as one of the best to work with. According to them, it was always vibes and fun. This brought out the best in his artists and the results showed in the end products. Most importantly, he never cheated his artists and always made sure that they got their money. Even while other producers were cheating their musicians out of royalties from international sales, Jonjo always made arrangements for them to be paid their royalties directly by the foreign labels distributing their records. As far as music producers were concerned, he was a don in Jamaica. But by 1985, a huge wave of Jamaicans were emigrating to the US. Jonjo chose to follow this wave and decided to move his operation to New York, presumably for greener pastures. But not long after his arrival, he would get in trouble with the NYPD. His association with members of what was then a growing Jamaican drug posse would result in him getting arrested for narcotics offenses and sentenced to jail time in the infamous Rikers Island prison. In the same year Jonjo left Jamaica and got in trouble with the law, popular producer Prince Jami would produce a track titled Under Miss Leng Teng for an artist named Wayne Smith. It became the first digital dancehall track and its runaway success resulted in the dawn of a new era, an era where dancehall artists could walk into a studio without a band and craft a hit with only a keyboard and drum machine, worlds apart from what Jonjo had been doing with great success. Jonjo was released in 1991 and was deported to Jamaica. Upon his return, he tried to reproduce his earlier success and began to work with the likes of Ninja Man, Coco T and John Holt. But the industry had moved on and it was difficult for him to catch up. He later moved to the UK and settled in London but sadly in June 14, 1999, Henry Jonjo Laws was killed in the housing area of London in a drive-by shooting while he was in a car. It's been alleged that the slaying was by gang members and connected to drugs but the case has never been solved. So that was the end of Jonjo Laws, one of the brightest lights of reggae it's been said that for all his talent, he was unable to truly leave his bad man days behind and that was what finally took him out at just 39 years of age. But I guess we'll never really know the truth. But what I can say for certain is that his sudden departure from dance hall at his peak deprived the, the reggae community of dance hall's biggest champion. But on the bright side, he opened the doors for a whole new generation of legends to come into their own and bless the world with their amazing talent. So there you have it. Thank you for watching the video today, please leave a like, subscribe and until next time, Jobless.